Godzilla vs Kong brings the smackdown, but sidesteps some of the smaller details on the road to two giant monsters duking it out. From missing titans to character deaths, here are our top questions. Godzilla King of the Monsters concluded with a provocative image, all of Earth's titans bowing before Godzilla, officially crowning him a monster royalty. The movie's end credit sequence pushed things even further. As Godzilla kept them all in line, the titans become forces for good, creating new rainforests in desolate lands, healing decimated animal populations, even stopping the effects of global warming. This sequence seems like it's setting the stage for Godzilla vs Kong's big showdown too, as news reports reveal seismic disturbances on Skull Island are attracting the Titans' attention. But then, nothing. Not only do we never learn what happened when the Titans reach Skull Island, but those characters are missing from Godzilla vs. Kong entirely. A throwaway line explains that the Titans haven't been seen for three years, but that doesn't explain why they disappeared. Godzilla vs. Kong's opening credits lists a number of Titans that have been defeated by Godzilla, but that doesn't mean they're dead. We already know that Godzilla needs to keep the other Titans in line every now and then. Narratively, it's probably best that Godzilla vs. Kong focuses on the two biggest draws, but it's still odd that the rest of the titans are completely missing during the kaiju grudge match of the century. At the end of Godzilla King of the Monsters, eco-terrorist Alan Jonah was down but not out. Sure, his attempts to save the Earth by unleashing the Titans and causing an extinction-level event to wipe out all humans failed, but he seemed to have other tricks up his sleeve. As King of the Monsters' post credit sequence revealed, Jonah bought one of Monster Zero's severed heads. By all indications, he planned to use it for nefarious purposes. What those purposes are remains to be seen. While Ghidorah's corpse is a key plot point in Godzilla vs. Kong, it's not clear if this is the same body part that Jonah secured in the previous movie. Even if it is, that raises more questions than answers. Mechagodzilla actually relies on two Monster Zero skeletons. One skull is used in the pilot's interface, while another is in the robotic kaiju itself. So even if this skull was originally Jonah's, Apex still had to find another one. And if that is the case, how did Apex get the skull from Jonah? If it's not, then where is Jonah and his rogue kaiju head? Either way, what was he originally planning? Yes, I might have gotten away with it too. It wasn't for these blasted kids and their dog. So it's that, just replace Dog with Godzilla. See how it all leads back to Scooby-Doo? Everything does. Tragic pasts and dead families drive a lot of the action in Godzilla vs Kong. Madison lost both her brother and her mother in Titan attacks. Nathan Lind is haunted by the death of his brother, who perished trying to enter Hollow Earth. Little Gia's entire family died when storms ravaged Skull Island, wiping out their Iwi. Even Kong himself is an orphan. Kong Skull Island revealed that the Skull Crawlers killed his parents, which is one big reason why he relates so much to Gia. Conspiracy theorist and undercover Apex employee Bernie Hayes has some tragedy in his past too. As he explains to Madison and her friend Josh, he wasn't always alone. At one point, he had a loving wife, who gave him a flask of whiskey that he keeps in a gun holster. When Josh needs to disrupt the satellite signal that gives Mechagodzilla its power, that flask comes in handy. But without more information, it feels a little bit like a deus ex machina. Not only do we never learn why Bernie's wife gave him such an odd gift, but we never know exactly what happened to her. Presumably, her death has something to do with Bernie's transformation from family man to conspiracy-loving nutcase. But in the the absence of any real information, we'll just have to use our imaginations. The Iwi, Skull Island's indigenous people, play a big role in Kong Skull Island, the movie that introduced Kong to the MonsterVerse. The movie shows how the Iwi rescued and befriended Hank Marlow, as well as the members of the Monarch Expedition. They worshipped Kong like a god and relied on him to protect them from the giant monsters that plagued the island. The Iwis won't speak their name, but I call them Skull Crawlers. Why? because it sounds neat. However, by the time that Godzilla vs Kong rolls around, they're gone. As the movie explains, a storm ravaged Skull Island and wiped out all of the Iwi, save for a little girl named Gia. Unfortunately, that's all we get. It's an explanation that's strikingly odd in its brevity. After all, storms have hit Skull Island plenty of times before. The entire island is perpetually surrounded by one, which is why it remains secluded for so long. Given Godzilla vs Kong's fascination with weird pseudoscience, there's clearly more going on here. Maybe the storm has something to do with the mysterious seismic activity and increasing geological instability on the island, hinted at in Godzilla King of the Monsters credit sequence. Maybe it's a side effect of Hollow Earth, or the big increase in Titan activity. Maybe the storms created by Ghidorah in King of the Monsters did the job. We'll probably never know for sure though, and that's a shame. 
Mothra met her tragic end in Godzilla King of the Monsters, when King Ghidorah vaporized her with one of his gravity beams. Mothra's ashes seemed to give Godzilla the power up he needed to take Ghidorah down, but the end credits hinted that she may not be gone for good. Monarch finds massive egg. Could giant insect egg be a second Mothra or something else? A headline of the United World News website proclaimed. According to the news story, the egg was discovered inside Mothra's territory and was taken to a Monarch research lab for further study. By the time that Godzilla vs. Kong rolls around, it hasn't been forgotten either. One episode of Birdie's podcast, Titan Truth, carries the title Mothra Pregnancy Theory and has the following subhead. So who's the baby daddy? These are all good questions, but Godzilla vs. Kong doesn't provide the answers. In the original Japanese Godzilla films, Mothra is a mystical being who often goes through a cycle of death and rebirth. Similarly, King of the Monsters implies there have been other Mothras before. If the Monsterverse continues, Mothra's return seems almost inevitable, we just don't know how quite yet. Apex Cybernetics doesn't send Kong, Nathan, Dr. Eileen Andrews, and Gia to Hollow Earth out of the goodness of its corporate heart. It wants something. Specifically, Apex CEO Walter Simmons is after Hollow Earth's ultra-powerful energy source, which he hopes to use to make Mechagodzilla the ultimate anti-Titan weapon. He succeeds too. Once the Hollow Earth expedition identifies the energy source, Simmons' daughter, Maya, takes the sample, analyzes it, and sends her findings to dear old dad. She tries to escape through the new Godzilla-made tunnel to the surface, with a sample too. But Kong's too quick for her. The giant ape grabs the heave that Maya is fleeing in and with one flex of his hand crushes it into bits. It doesn't matter. Apex receives Maya's transmission and within minutes supercharges Mecha Godzilla. But hold on, that's not really how power typically works. Usually, you need an actual substance in hand to extract energy or to create a chemical reaction or something. Power isn't really something that can be delivered via email. Not scientifically possible! It's possible that Apex was able to quickly replicate the Hollow Earth energy source using Maya's data and pump it into Mechagodzilla immediately, but the whole thing happens so fast that it's extremely unclear. As a sequel, Godzilla vs. Kong pulls double duty. It's a follow-up to both Godzilla King of the Monsters and Kong Skull Island. A few King of the Monsters characters resurface in Godzilla vs. Kong, and the film references a few more. Ren Serizawa, Apex's chief technical officer and Mechagodzilla's pilot, is the son of Ichiro Serizawa, who was introduced in Godzilla and heroically sacrificed himself to save Godzilla in King of the Monsters. Unfortunately, Kong Skull Island's main characters don't get the same treatment. While World War II vet Hank Marlowe was likely passed on, James Conrad would be in his late 80s, while war photographer Mason Weaver should only be in her 70s. Conrad actually appeared briefly in the King of Monsters prequel comic Godzilla Aftershock, which is set just a few months after the 2014 Godzilla movie as an elder monarch agent. Weaver, however, hasn't been seen since the end of Skull Island. Given that Godzilla vs. Kong is the first movie to continue Skull Island's storyline, you'd expect Kong's closest human allies to at least cameo, if they're still alive and kicking. Godzilla vs. Kong offers viewers a few reasons why the two monsters don't like each other. First, they're both Alpha Titans, meaning the Earth quite literally isn't big enough for the both of them. Then there's the fact that Godzilla constantly endangers people Kong cares about. The biggest and most compelling explanation, however, is that there's bad blood between their two families. As documented in legends and ancient art, Godzilla and Kong's ancestors were the Hatfields and McCoys of monsters, spending generations caught up in a long and brutal war. That sounds awesome, but Godzilla vs. Kong only offers hints as to how this conflict unfolded. A stray line of dialogue here, a mysterious cave drawing there. Finally, when Kong returns to his ancestral home in Hollow Earth, it seems like the movie is going to deliver the goods. But what we do get, that awesome Godzilla spike axe, is just another tease. It sure looks like the Kong family emerged triumphant in this epic struggle. After all, you don't sit on a throne unless you've earned the title of king, but there's a good chance we won't ever know exactly what happened. For the most part, the human characters in Godzilla vs. Kong are nearly as interesting as the monsters, but villain Walter Simmons does get one standout moment. Near the movie's climax, when Simmons has Maddie, Josh, and Bernie dead to rights, he launches into a good old-fashioned supervillain monologue where he recounts a dream he had after Godzilla first appeared. Unfortunately, he never gets to finish, as he's killed by Mecha Godzilla mid-monologue. Bichir oozes slimy charisma, but Simmons' motivation in Godzilla vs. Kong feels just a wee bit undercooked. Knowing what motivated Simmons would have made him a lot more interesting. And it's too bad he didn't get another minute or so to fully explain what he had up his soon-to-be-devoured sleeve. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite movie moments are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.